in Miami going for the three right away. Just attack the basket. James catches, puts up the three. Won't we'll go. Rebound, box. Back out to Allen. His three point of Tie game with five seconds. Welcome to the Ultimate Super Coach and Fantasy Sports Show. You are now listening to the Insight Fantasy Sports Podcast. Boom shakalaka! Yes, we are back for another episode of the Insight NBA Show on the Insight Podcast Network. I am Nathan Brain and I am joined by the NBA guru himself, Lead fantasy analyst for Inside NBA, the NBA G. Where's Matty G? How are you, mate? Is, is Guru, is that what the G stands for now, Brainer? Yes, yes. Uh, Mr. Guru is, I think, is is uh, what it's code for, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much, mate. Yeah, good to good to be with you on a – this is our first duo pod together, and we're talking about a team, I guess, that neither one of us are overly – like, we're not thrilled about these guys. There's nothing sexy apart from Madison Square Garden, but we're talking the New York Knicks. Uh, it's a dream. I, I guess it's like my all, like – if you have to do like the tiers, I know you're a big like Hawks fan. I think one of my NBA dreams is to watch a game in the garden just because of that history. So for that yeah. one and, and the history of the team, I like them. But also I think there's a couple of things we can learn from them. What what do you like a little what do you like a couple of the blokes in the Knicks this year, mate? Yeah, there's a I'm not too I must admit, I mean, spoiler alert, I'm not too excited about them. Uh, I'm not too excited about the starting lineup, if I'm completely honest. There's a, a few guys on there that are I'm not touching with a 10 foot pole. I'll give you the red hot tip. Um, but there are a couple of rotation, a couple of rotation guys that, that we'll talk about very soon. And a couple of guys that could get some opportunity off the bench for the Knicks. Uh, we know that uh, Tom Thibodeau doesn't exactly like using too many players in his lineup. So we know there's minutes there for the guys that get on the court. It's just a matter of whether they're going to get on the court uh, and, and how they're going to be used. So very interesting uh, to talk uh, about the Knicks today. I'm, I'm interested to get your thoughts, mate, on especially on last year because, I mean, a lot of the time uh, and from what we're seeing in Knicks fandom uh, in the community at the moment is that they're thinking that this could potentially be their best team or their best roster to date in the last recent few years. How do you feel about that? God, I don't want to be aggregated by Knicks fans. That would be just <laughs> like a suicide. Um, though, look, I actually don't think they're wrong. I actually think when I look at this squad that I'm really, really happy. We'll get to that with how the starting five plays out. I mean, look who they brought in. I also just have this feeling in my soul that this isn't all that the Knicks are bound for personnel-wise this year in whatever embracement of shape that takes. And I have a personal thought about that. Um, I, I personally think that the Knicks, they're, they're, they're a playoff team. And they and they they, 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 they we're a playoff team last year. They're, they're a good team. I think the acquisition of Jalen Brunson, obviously, last year just elevated them again and had Julius Randle return to the form that we needed him to have. After having that breakout season, you would say, then getting the money and then being a bit of a, a soppy bastard. Uh, and, it, you know, I think, look, I think the Knicks fans are right on the money with being excited. If I was in New York, I would be like really responsive to what the Knicks have in store this year, Brandon. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I, I do agree with them. I think on, on paper, you look at this lineup and they could do some damage in the playoffs. And they showed us last year against the Cavs, you know, they obviously knocked them out first round. Nice little comeback there. Tom Thibodeau had to change his tactics a fair bit there in that finals when they were down. Um, he, he resorted to playing Quinton Grimes more minutes and he didn't want to do it. You've seen him make some changes. Evan Fournier out of the lineup midseason. So he did yep. some things he normally wouldn't do. So you can see there that he was obviously at his job on the line. So, you know, it, it's very interesting to see uh, him change tack mid-season to make the adjustments he needed to make for New York to have success last year. And that's the one thing about them that I, I didn't really get. Like they end, they finished fifth in the Eastern Conference. So again, when I say a playoff team, I'm not talking about like they're a play in getting there. Like they finished 47 and 35 last year, which was, you know, good record. So we'll get to the overs and unders for the end. The thing which really got for me is they're a really slow, grindy team. Like they were 25th out of 30 teams in the NBA for pace last season. Like this isn't the up and down free running like New York Knicks. This is like, like dog fight kind of yeah. basketball, Tom Thibodeau style, which is yeah. funny though, because they had the third best offensive rating in the NBA last year, but they had which, the 19th. 
def- best defense. And this is a Thibodeau team who's usually, you know, that's, you, you'd expect that to it's be the opposite. Right? You would, yeah. you would. And also a team that has RJ Barrett on it in its starting lineup playing 32 minutes a night being the third best defensive team is quite baffling in itself, knowing how inefficient he is at scoring the basketball. So, and also the, his, we'll talk about it soon. His, his usage was pretty high as well. So that just shows you how much weight uh, Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle were actually carrying for this team to make sure that they were third on offense. Yeah, a hundred percent. And look, when I think about this team last year, I don't, it's kind of weird. I think, I'm one of these dumb take people sometimes where I know what I'm saying is like the sounds is going to sound so stupid to a listener to hear. But if I think about it rationally, I actually. What in the fuck was that? Pretty much. I um, I don't think they were too far off maybe beating Miami. I mean, they lost 4 2 um, in those conference finals um, to the Heat, obviously. So that's. And a couple of those games weren't that close. But they were a team that I actually thought could trouble. I didn't think they could beat them, but I thought they could at least trip. Same way that I think about the Lakers. I actually, I know, I know that they were swept. But if you look at the box score at the end of the day and how close some of those, watch back some of those games and how close they were, there was an opportunity where it would have flipped and seen a, a Lakers might be a Lakers finals last year. Um, so I don't think too far off. Yeah, I've... Yeah, I mean, let's see how they go this year. It's going to be very interesting. But, um, mate, let's let's talk ins and outs. Let's talk about how uh, they've gone in the offseason because they haven't really made much movement. No. They haven't really done much, have they? They've got Dante DiVincenzo. I think it was four years, 54 million. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, um, for, for off the top of the rip, yeah, I'll look it up. There's a, there's a bit of um, talk around Dante DiVincenzo and what role they're going to use him in. You know, he could – he's another small guard that fits into the small guard category of, you know, Brunson – uh, Grimes, you've also got Emmanuel quickly there. You've got now Di Vincenzo. You've got a, like a bit of a log jam at the point guard shooting guard spot uh, this year in this team. Uh, so there could be some movement maybe throughout the season. There could be a trade on the surface there that, that could potentially happen. And we might talk about that very soon. We won't ruin it just yet. But aside from them, I mean, they lose Obi Toppin to Indiana Pacers and they've lost Derek Rose. And they've made a couple of two-way signings in Dylan Windler and Nathan Knight and obviously re-signed Josh Hart, which has been the talk of the town. Thoughts on this movement? Is there any kind of improvement there to this roster? Yeah, look, Dante gives you a little bit of extra juice. Uh, Four-year, $46 million uh, is guaranteed with them. They can bump up with the contracts, but it's the base salary with his extras that are apparently is part of his contract. I like Dante. He's like the epitome of a team player for me. Like Dante Vigincenzo is like he's been a serviceable Milwaukee buck. He's been a very serviceable Golden State Warrior. This is a guy that I just love his locker room presence, but that doesn't really move the dial as far as championship aspirations go. But then again, he's a lot better than Obi Toppin for this team by way of Obi is very much a like power forward, small forward, get to the rim, like athletic. This is an experienced guy. So he's moving into the more, I guess, veteran presence. So I love that. The thing for me is I've been high on Josh Hart for a long time. I've spoken about him to you in chats for the last couple of years. I love to see him starting to get the recognition that he deserves as a basketball player. Because when he went in, he could have stayed with the Lakers. 100% he could have still been with that Lakers deal that went to the Pelicans. He was an extra throw in like, what else would you like? We'll give you everything. (laughs) And then he started putting together those silly stretches with the Pelicans. And he was the guy. And then he was a blazer. And he did the exact same thing again. So he's gotten better. Like he's matured. And I think signing him is a really good, yeah, really good for the Knicks. And, and what I love about it specifically is that he's on a Tom Thibodeau team who yep. loves to lean into his veteran players and he loves to really heavily rely on those kind of players, those workhorse type players, those guys that he knows are not going to make too many defensive lapses. They're not going to take too many yeah, bad Tark shots. Gibson. Josh is yeah. the new Taj Gibson. It could be. He could be. Fuck, I hope he's a bit better than Taj Gibson. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, otherwise, mate, not much to go through. But let's let's move into the roster and what that looks like for this year, or maybe even the, just the fantasy relevant guys for twenty three, twenty four. Um, as you can see, for anybody who's watching us on YouTube, you're going to see little indicators there on the left hand side of each player and how we see these players either staying the same if it's an equal sign, going backwards if it's a red negative. Plus is obviously a, a, an improvement there. You'll see Josh Hart. We've got a little plus next to him, so that probably leads us into that. And the left, right, red, and green is 
could go either way. So we'll explain these soon, but talk me through, G, what, what are your thoughts here? What stands out initially for you with, with these nine to 10 guys? Um, the fact that nine to 10 guys rarely ever see the fucking floor in a Tom Thibodeau team. Um, apart from that, nothing much. No, look, I, I think you, you spot on the money. The, we'll call out the equal sign guys straight away because one of them, again, is Dante DiVincenzo, who's a new addition from the Golden State Warriors. And we're talking about equal value. We don't say they're about roughly going to finish. If, if you were to tell me at the end of the 23, 24 season that Jalen Brunson finished 50th, that's because he finished 50th last year. So we, we're talking equal value to that. So the guys who we see is probably pertaining to similar equal value to the last season. So you don't want to draft them too early in your drafts this year because what they did last year as well was their return value. It was really curious with Jalen Brunson more than most. He had gone mm. over to the Knicks. It was unknown. His ADP rounded into about where he finished off the season where some guys like that, their ADP is like 70s or the 80s and they end up being a steal of a draft. He wasn't that much of a steal. We see him as equal value. Emmanuel quickly, who finished at about 120th last year. Dante DiVincenzo at about 130th. I think, Breno, I know you put these together. That's the only one that I could possibly see going back a bit more, depending mm -hmm. if Quentin Grimes, which is the either way marker you've got there. If Quentin gets more of a run, then I see Dante DiVincenzo sliding back in value quite a lot. And I see Quentin going caught up right there. I, why did you put Quentin there with the the red and the green? The it can go either way. Well, I'm not actually sure whether he starts. I mean, there's there's so many different kind of combinations that you can use at the two. And and realistically, at the moment, we've got Quentin Grimes starting in the at the two guard position for for the start of the year. It's kind of how they finished the year. We've seen we've seen Tom Thibodeau want to lean into Quentin Grimes and. Honestly, in, in a few years' time, he could be the guy we're talking about that's scoring 24, 25 points a night. He's, he's got that upside, doesn't he? Um, but again, do you want the reliability of Emmanuel Quickly, who is a, a really good defender, off the back of that? Dante DiVincenzo has also shown that he's a really good defender, can shoot the three ball and get to the rim. Um, you know, so all three of those guys I probably look at as maybe on level pegging or on par in terms of ability. I think there's more upside in Quentin Grimes. And I probably feel like maybe Emmanuel Quickly is the guy that's a little bit more reliable to run the the bench unit or, or play as the sixth man in this lineup. So if Quentin Grimes gets the two guard spot and he starts the year and he manages to get that, I mean, he averaged what, 29.9 minutes a game last year. If he ends up going up to potentially 32 minutes a game this year and gets those starter minutes, he's definitely a plus in my book. And I think he's definitely someone who ingratiated himself a little bit more into the, uh, the hearts and minds of Tom Thibodeau. Uh, mm -hmm. And play that, you know, that hard, good soldier work that he likes to see. And then Quentin started to get them in. Because he was also like one of those benched guys. Like you don't really hear about much. It's also important to note like guys like dunk, cont dunk contestant champion, Mr. Jericho Sims, aren't really fantasy relevant on this one. That's why they're not on this chart. So it's not like we hate Jericho Sims. Like, oh, what about Jericho? You don't know the Knicks. No, fuck Jericho Sims. He's not fantasy relevant. And if he gets fantasy relevant, it's like the movie King Ralph with John Goodman back in the 80s or 90s where the plane of the royals or something, oh no, there was a photo of the royal family taken and they all fried and died. And then oh, good. John, Goodman is the, John Goodman becomes king of the royal family. That's pretty much what's going to happen for Jericho <laughs> Sims to have any fantasy relevance when we're talking about the Knicks because the guy there that you say do not draft is Isaiah Hartenstein who last year there was that whole upside of him. Like, oh, let's get, let's draft in Isaiah Hartenstein. And then we liked him for a little bit when Mitch Robinson was out. But again, they didn't play a lot of big ball minutes with him. And yeah. he ended up finishing the season with the 204th value. He was an okay stream target. And he's like, as you can see there, his field goal percentage is excellent. His free throws are not great at 678, but he's a guy you don't want to draft unless you're really stuck. But the upside we were hoping for in 22 and 23 obviously wasn't there. It's not going to be there in 23, 24. So we don't want to touch guys like Isaiah Hartenstein. No. And, uh, you know, Isaiah Hartenstein and Isaiah Roby, the two Isaiahs, uh, Isaiah squared, uh, they, they're probably both relevant through injury only. And I think that's probably yeah. where we'd leave it. You know, they're, they're probably the first two I'd look at. If uh, Julius Randle went down, if, like you mentioned, if Mitch Robinson inevitably goes down at some point during the year, Definitely. I mean, Julius Randle finished the season with an ankle injury, had ankle surgery over the off season. And, and all word is that he's ready to go for training camp. But how, I mean, he's not getting any younger, is he? He's getting older and older every single season. And his usage is through the roof, as you can see here, 28.8% usage. I've done a few of these team previews now, luckily with insight. And, 
I don't remember seeing anything above 28.8 usage in the teams that I've covered this year. And I know you've covered a few. Have you seen anything close to that? Yeah, I have. I've seen a few, but we're talking guys here like usage percent wise. Look, I'll, let me go up to, the, I'll go to NBA.com while you talk us through, because I want to ask you a question on this one. I'll come back to Julius Randle, because I have some cool. interesting Julius Randle points on that. I would okay, love for you to know, though, why you see Mitch Robinson down, though, because you've got I, Mitch down where I'm thinking he could be back up playing okay. more games. So talk me through that thinking. Yeah, my, my only thoughts are, and maybe this is tainted by my negative Mitch Robinson experience from two years ago when I drafted him and thought, look, starting center on the Knicks, he's going to get minutes. He's going to do well. He's good. He's going to cover my block category. Yeah. And he's going to be great for field goal percentage. And he, and he suited the build that I had for that year. But then uh, there were some games he played 14 minutes a night and they moved Julius Randle to the five. Uh, there were some games where he played 32 minutes a night and he was fantastic and he won me the week. But yep. just that up and down roller coaster that I got from Mitch Robinson maybe tainted me in the in the wrong way with with him and just knowing there's weeks where he can honestly either get injured or he can play 15 minutes a night if it doesn't fit in and he wants to play small ball which like you just mentioned is something that Thibs would love to do he doesn't fit yep. into that lineup and and he's the guy that will not move probably outside the paint for the whole season uh, he doesn't have a three ball doesn't really even have a mid range. Um, so he's look, they're going to use him in the pick and roll. They're going to use him pretty close to the basket. And uh, I don't know whether Tibbs loves playing that way. Yeah, I'm always undecided. I mean, he obviously has shown himself as a rim protector over the time. Um, I am not anti Mitch Robinson in your team, especially if, you, if you're punting free throw percentage and you're looking to hunt down blocks. And if you're building that yeah. kind of team, he is the absolute perfect complement in that way. Um, yeah. And I think that's where it really plays into it. That Mitch Robinson is an excellent player when playing that role in your fantasy team. In yep. an NBA sense, he is he is excellent as a rim protector. Like he is a rim deterrent, but rim deterrency or like, hey, I don't want to fuck with that guy. I don't mm -hmm. want to get my shot blocked. That's not really a fantasy category. So mm -hmm. that's where, where, where big Mitchie Robinson really moves outside of that. Look, he's probably about the 80, like in the late, 80s to 100s if you're punting field goal if you're punting free throw percentage he escalates up your list entirely into top 50 value kind of thing like he's kind of in that top 60 zone i would argue if i was to do that i actually should run that through fantasy tours i'll do that later on we're talking about through the starting five but that's the kind of guy when i'm looking at that that i'm i'm curious by usage wise when we talk about it and this is what i want to talk about the julius randall of the matter let's go to the next slide there let's go to the starting five right because i'm really curious about how you put this together and my thoughts on julius randall because as you can see there julius randall's adp last year um julius randall's adp was like 45 he ended up being the 54th value last season and you've got him coming down this year is it because of his age like you touched on mate a little bit um, yeah. I feel like last year was like, honestly borderline career year for Randall. Like, do you, do you feel the same? Like um, I drafted him last year. I was one of the guys that picked him up at the 45 to 50 and I was stoked about it and pretty happy with it. Um, you know, 46% from the field isn't terrible. He's not going to hurt you field goal percentage. I know that obviously that's not rated in a good category when you're a power forward or you're playing a little bit closer to the bucket, but 46% is fine for the way that he yeah. plays. He shot 2.8, oh, he got 2.8 threes per game he shot eight threes per game last year so if your three point percentage is a category it's not fantastic but uh I, I don't see him being a bad player i just think 54 I'm, I'm when i'm going off 54 i think maybe he could be around that 65 to 70 range this year uh points per game at 25 as well does his usage go down does brunson's come up um you know 28.8 are they really going to run everything through randall again this year um because it seems like that is literally how the Knicks are going to perform is how Julius Randle is playing. So if Julius Randle has a bit of a drop off, the Knicks will probably have a bit of a drop off as well, realistically. Yeah. The, his um, 2021 season, which I thought, well, let's call that peak Randle. Yep. Uh, he was the 27th ranked player according to hashtag basketball that year. So this is like a top 30 player. The thing with me is, and I ran this just then through fantasy scores as well. So I was very curious about the value. Uh, well, let's talk about the value of Julius Randle in drafts. Uh, Matty O'Brien and I, um, SC Matrix, we're doing a show about guys who are slipping in drafts. We didn't flirt with him by this draft, but he, it brought to our attention where guys were going when we were examining ADPs. So if you're looking at to punt certain things in your team, Julius Randle becomes incredibly valuable. So if you're punting turnovers, 
field goal percentages, and steals. So according to Fantasy Scores, and a big shout out to our sponsors there for giving us this tool to play around with this gear, um, I ran some of the analytics for Julius Randle. If I was to punt those three categories, this is a guy who shoots up your board. Mm-hmm. If I was to tell you, if I was to ask you according to them what he think he would be predicted to go at what would you say he'd roughly be his adp right now? if you were if you were punting categories yep. did you say or uh no, oh, i don't know generally. what do you, what, what do you Just, think his value is like top 70 top 80 top 90 top 50 i'd probably maybe say top 60 yeah they've got him he's going in the top 60s adp wise quite averagely because there's this as you said there's this whole thing that the success of the knicks is tied to julius randall Hmm. And this whole like, like, I mean, I remember watching Kobe in the gym and I'm going to work hard kind of guy. Those were the 2020, 2021 stories. And then he had that 21, 22 season where he was like, fuck the Knicks. I want to be traded. And then he salvaged that at back next year because the team was doing good. So it's like, Hmm. what version of Julius are we going to get? Because he's the 78th ranked player, according to Fanta's Z scores, based on Z scores. However, if I decide to boot my steals, I boot, so I just ran a quick punt build. I, I booted steals. I booted field goal percentage and I booted turnovers. Julius Randall goes up 49 spots okay, and yeah. becomes the 29th ranked player if I'm punting those. So that's a must draft guy in the forties or the fifties, because in my build, he's going to eclipse that much like RJ Barrett goes up 121 ranks in the Knicks in the exact same breath. And that's a guy we haven't really talked on much. RJ Barrett. Like, is we are we ever going to see the RJ breakout season, mate? Are we? Uh, no. Purely <laughs> because I feel like, I mean, look, okay, so he finished 238th in value last year. Um, you know, when we look at his stats across the board, you kind of think, oh, he's not a bad player. He averages 20 points a game. He gets you five boards, two and a half assists. But he also is 43% from the field. Um, he shoots a million threes. His efficiency is poor. He shoots 73.9% from the free throw line. And he gets you no steals or blocks. So, I mean, yeah, you've got to be punting a bloody lot of categories to, to make this guy kind of valuable in, in your squad. 238, do I think that that's not realistic? Yes. I don't think he'll be 238 again. I think you're probably looking more at RJ Barrett around that 150 mark, I'd say. But unless yeah. that efficiency takes a big turn this year and maybe the usage goes down 25.6 is pretty high for a guy that is the third option on the on the on the court um so maybe that takes a takes a hit and the usage takes a hit but maybe the efficiency goes up and he becomes a top 150 player great but i don't ever see him as a top 100 player not not from my end anyway there is this illusion of rj barrett of a basketball player that i just don't think exists in the reality of basketball and how he's used in the knicks like Look, there is a version of RJ Barrett that is a very serviceable guy. But as you said, like, if you look at it, if his free throw percentage went up to the 800s, good. If his field goal percentage was like 460, good. If he got me a steal a game because he has that athleticism, that youth, that wingspan, and he could put that to good use in the defensive mindset, I'd be all about picking up RJ Barrett. The one thing that I, I do love, and I want to tell our viewers and our listeners, I will tell you to put RJ Barrett in your team. If he is on waivers, if you can pick him up, don't burn a waiver priority. So if you have waiver priorities in your league and you're looking at like, oh, I don't want to, oh, I'm number two or three, who do I get? Just be really tactical with the use of those waiver priorities. And I think that's a, like one of the tips that I'm gonna, we're going to get to, Breno, when we do our like top tips for your season, like what to use, what not to use. Don't burn one on RJ Barrett. But if you're coming up to a weekend and you're in a tight one, And he's on the waiver wire and you can pick him up and the Knicks play a Thursday game. They have a Friday game off and then they play a back to back on a Saturday and Sunday. And you're like thinking, I need to get some points here. Um, I'm safe field goal percentage wise. Like I'm I'm not going to win that. I'm not going to win my free throw percentage. I I can feed a couple of assists a game. I can feed steals and I can survive. If you just desperately need some extra threes stripped in and some points, that's the kind of serviceability that RJ Barrett can get you in fantasy. Until he yeah. becomes a fully rounded spectacle of himself that we wish to see. Do you do you ever think that he can reach the heights that he's actually capable of reaching in New York? Is it a New York Knicks thing that RJ Barrett's kind of tied to where that he's just never going to have the role that he needs to succeed in New York? 
I don't like talking shit about NBA players. Like, as you said, like when we're these analysts and we look at these things through our hat and be like, oh, this guy, and I'm looking at stats and numbers. I'm like, oh, that guy's good. Oh, that guy's pretty shit. Like I, I look at that and that's what kind of comes to mind when I look at RJ Barrett. I'm like, oh, that's good. Like when you read this left to right, you see things that are very average. Like, oh, usage, usage is great. Usage means it translates. And then I see points. I'm like, oh, 19 points. That's just good. It's not even very good. Like very good is like 20, like 23, 24 points a game plus. He's not even hitting 20 points a game. Mm. 1.73s, mate, drip me in 2.5. I just think he doesn't have this on a team. I don't think he is a superstar. I don't think he's an all-star player. RJ Barrett's not an all-star. He's not a star. He's yep. a player in the NBA. And I think then, unfortunately, the Knicks, obviously, that they've got so much investment in him, not just financially, but with picking him up in as a lottery pick. Um, you know, they've invested so much of their resources into this guy that they're going to want some serious value back in a trade. So, you know, when we're talking trades, are there any trades that you feel could be brewing for New yep. York? Yep. Tell, talk us through, yep. mate. What do you reckon? Yep. Oh, oh, this is one. This, this is tied to a whole bunch of stuff. Carl Anthony Towns. Um, like the whole Leon Rose thing just doesn't go away. That whole Kentucky thing with me, I would be putting in, I haven't worked this out in the trade machine. God, can we screen share a trade machine live? Jesus, I want to figure this out. There's been talk of cat going, there's been, there's been talk of cat going to the Knicks for a little while now. Um, we're doing, again, this show that I'm doing with Maddie, I've picked up cat as one of the guys who people are, he's slipping down in our drafts a little bit. So I definitely see that he is a potential place. Then again, we, as of today, the news is that the Miami Heat have re-engaged Damian Lillard in trade talks. I don't know if there's a third way facilitation thing going on with the Knicks, but they are trade friendly. They're not adjacent to not doing anything to make mm. this a championship possible caliber team. If you could put RJ Barrett and Mitch Robinson in a deal, actually, you wouldn't put Mitch Robinson in the deal. That would be dumb. Because, but you want him off your team if you bring in Cat, because we've just seen the whole Rudy Gay experience with Cat. We know two players that clog that area don't necessarily work with him. So if you could move RJ and Julius and bring in Carl Anthony Towns, ship off Mitch and bring in someone else, there's a whole lot of action that could happen in this team. I just don't think it's going to happen. RJ, if you could, yeah, if, if Mitch Robinson was your backup center, Cat was your center. Julius Randle was your power forward. RJ was off your team and you could bring in one of your guys there. You could slide someone down into that small forward spot. Like, <coughs> Josh, like Hart. The, Josh Hart, I was about to ask because that brings us to our next slide. If you could bring in Mr. Do Everything, Mr. Well-Rounded, that would be a, that would be a team I could see going very far in the Eastern Conference this year. If you had a starting point guard of Julius, a, a Jalen Brunson, if you had any one of your rotation of exceptional shooting guards or spaces there with Quentin Grimes, Emmanuel Quickly, someone like that, a really menacing small forward stopper like Josh Hart has just been brought in to stop some of the best players in the world. Sure, it wasn't that successful at times because they didn't win the gold medal, but he still played a hell of a good game. Julius Randle is your power forward and Carl Anthony Towns is your center. I can see that team going very, very deep in your Eastern Conference. I'm with you on that. I like it. I mean, as you can see here, Josh, the hitman heart, um, for any of you WWE, WWE fans out there, I, I'm i big on him. I, I really like him. I mean, he, he finished 101 rank at the end of the season, but obviously that doesn't take into it. That accounts the whole season, right? We're looking post-trade deadline when everything started to happen for Josh Hart. He got more minutes. Uh, you can say, oh, sorry, he got less minutes, but had, I, I guess, more relevance. He took better shots. He got more opportunity, I guess, in those minutes. Um, didn't score more points, took a couple more threes. His efficiency went up, as you can see there, from 529 to 586, which is quite a significant jump. Can he can he sustain that? Look, probably not. But, I mean, he takes a lot of shots that are relatively close to the rim. He can shoot the three ball. He's an elite defender. He can get you out of position rebounds, which is incredibly important, I think, in fantasy if you're chasing those out of position stats in general. You've got a guy that also is relatively hybrid in his positioning too. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not 100% sure on the the yahoo uh positioning but i'm sure he's a he's a triple point yes yeah, so he, he can go guard and forward so he can go shooting guard Perfect. small forward so he also then fits your guard spot and your power and your forward spot 
and obviously anyone's a utility, but he does have dual eligibility, which is always important there. Massive. That is huge, I think. you know, And we've got to start looking at guys like this. And the question now becomes... I mean, with 1.4 steals a game, I think is worth mentioning as well. That's, that is nearly, that's elite. That's incredibly good for what you're going to get back at the back end of what are we talking here? Even if you grabbed him at the, in the seventh round, I think his value there. Uh, how do you, where do you see him finishing this year? High. Oh, just, just as high I'm, as possible. I'm, I'm, just high. He, number one draft pick this. No, no, that's just stupid for me to say. No, look, I really like Josh Hart. Um, I'm seeing him slip and I've been in drafts with really knowledgeable NBA guys. We've been doing a whole bunch. Even the check the, the do not do this draft I did with Mickey Dell. That's a great draft where he's like, I've got to take Josh Hart because Josh Hart is a guy that was sliding around the draft. I did a draft with Adam King from FBI basketball and we were talking about the merits of him. And it just seems for this one random reason that no one is just really onto what the, the diversity of skills that Josh Hart brings to your fantasy team. He doesn't hurt you anywhere. So that's the first big uptick for him. I'm actually going through some of the values on him right now, as we were just talking about. And the guy is just doing his wonders. Like on his Yahoo, right now, this is just purely on Yahoo. ADP right now is 139.8. And if you're in a hundred, that's, if you're in a twelve-person league, that's that's like the second, fourth, fifth last pick. You know, it's it's crazy. This is a guy I see with top one hundred, top ninety upside for the year, and that's on the verge of him being. And by the way, ADP at one hundred and forty, basically, that means he's not being taken in some drafts. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that's like he's going 80, 90, 100, 110, but he's also not going in so many one forty-four person drafts that he's literally got the rank of 140th. You go through ESPN, I could find him, but mate, uh, they're all up here. But I th just think he's going to return top 100 value of the season. So the best advice that I can give in relation to Josh Hart is if you are after pick 100 and you would like to fill your team with just great diversity across the board. I mean, look at those stats. Like that's sexy. That steal rate, he doesn't hurt your free throw percentage because he doesn't get high volume. The field goal percentage just buoys you. If he can truly stretch, if he can stretch that floor to 1.5 or 1.6 threes a game, keep the similar seven rebounds, keep the similar assists because he loves to pass the ball, keep similar steals at maybe 1.2 his season average. This is a guy you absolutely grab in your waiver wire. Like so, you grab you grab in your draft, and if someone drops him because he's injured for a couple of weeks, pick him up. Like and just stash him if you, especially if you're in the top four in your league, just stash Josh Hart. Dump, dump your worst bloke. Get Josh Hart in your squad, hundred percent. Oh my God, it's so juicy. Yeah, absolutely. Woo. With you, with you on that one, mate. Let's uh, let's move on. We've had enough Josh Hart love as much as I'd love to continue to talk about him. But before we do, mate, we've mentioned fantasy scores a, a fair bit. Do you want to give us a, a, all the listeners and the viewers a little bit of a rundown on how they can use fantasy scores? And we, we've got a discount for them, don't we? Oh, we do have a discount. We love a bit of a saucy Ooh. discount. Five love US that. dollars off fantasy scores. It's perfect if you are drafting with Yahoo. It integrates perfectly into your um, into your whole like research for it. They have a draft tracker where you can check your team and you can look at your team and what you need to do. So, like we just spoke about before, how's this? Let me. I wish I could do a bit of a screen share on the fly right now. I'll literally jump onto the app and do this live. I, I shouldn't do this. Like just for no reason. I've got fantasy scores up here right now. Uh, can you give me a New York Nick in any punt build in the world right now, Brano? Any uh, let's New York go Nick. back. To, let's go back to their lineup and we'll see. We'll see what we can do because I. Yep. Let's say uh, we want to get Quentin Grimes in a punt build. Chuck him yep. in. See what, see what see what happens. All right. So Quentin Grimes right now is ranked about 132nd according to their metrics and their Z scores. Uh, if you would like to, let's say, punt field goal percentage again, probably with Quentin Grimes, he's still not all the way there. Uh, you're not really worried about turnovers with him. He doesn't turn the ball over much in the first place because he doesn't have much of a facilitator role. You're probably not really looking for many rebounds, I would say, with Quentin Grimes. Um, he can get you some, but he's not really going to up that too much. I've just plugged in rebounds, field goal percentage, and turnovers. And what this does is this gives me a real metric straight away. I can search by team. I can search by play name. I'm going to scroll straight down to my New York Knicks to make it really easy for my research. And I can see what that does. And straight away, if I'm looking at these, that actually ups Quentin Grimes only slightly. But it does tell me where Quentin Grimes is strong at. And where he is really strong is he's strong with his three-pointers. So that's the one that thing for him that's really great. But what it shows me as well is using the same build, 
It actually moves Jalen Brunson up 12 rankings. It moves Dante DiVincenzo up 29. So all of a sudden, I'm thinking maybe I don't want to touch Quentin Grimes. I probably want to target late in my draft if I'm punting those Dante DiVincenzo because he goes from 133 to 114, and that's the power of fantasy scores. It gives you that insight that we like to give you. $5 off. Use the promo code INSIGHT and jump onto it. Rock and roll. How good's that? And, I mean, we've talked a little bit about punting, the, the art of punting. Uh, I'm sure you're going to probably be doing a show, uh, you know, in, in the lead up to the, the season, talking about different punt bills and different ways to punt categories. Uh, I'm a big, uh, big fan of punting. Uh, I'd probably yeah. do it in every draft I do. I, I look at my first couple of picks and go, okay, where am I weak? Do I give up on that completely? Um, so, and, and it has worked for me in the past. But, yeah, the guys at Fantasy Scores will look after you for sure. So, um, mate. Let's move on to your slide because I, I enjoyed this one. I, I love a little bit of a you know uh, a fun intro, and there's a fair bit to talk about here, mate. So take it away. Uh, the New York Knicks, more streams than a nightclub urinal. You're not going to draft many New York Knicks in your in your fantasy leagues this year. Let's be honest. Um, I don't want to have to go between slides every now and then, but there's only certain players in this squad that have fantasy relevance and we've also spoke we've spoken to that fact about rj barrett not really being the best draft asset to burn a pick on if you're not burning field goal percentage and, and other things but for me there is some juiciness in him as a streamer if you can get him and target him like i mentioned earlier but guys like as you can see here or if you're listening at home these guys drip in some threes from across the way to the clip of two a game on their current lineup. And they're also Dante DiVincenzo last year. So if you need to stream in threes, you can target guys like Emmanuel Quickly, who also gets you almost 15 points a game, Dante DiVincenzo and Quentin Grimes at 2.2. But you also get a couple of dual threats in that. So if you want to up your steals a little bit, especially again, where you like to use streams, I think we need to, or we'll do a pod very soon about the power of streaming and what it means to stream successfully. Because streaming is a really, it's really advantageous that you use that. Look, I'm not an advocate of purely drafting one burn spot, which is the whole like the thought processes where you draft one spot that you're just going to use up and burn every single week. If you're in some leagues, you've got four spots a week to you can plays you can rotate in some five but you want to get those rotations happening to give yourself and some depths of some team but guys like quickly and dante di vincenzo who get you a steal a game and two threes you can get some assets off that quentin grimes can burn you some threes rj barrett can burn you points a few threes he can chip in rebounds and assist decent enough across the way like he doesn't kook you there he does add to those but on a back-to-back -back, especially if you're behind on points picking up 20 random points a game almost even if he goes down to 18 points that's 36 points with a guy if you look at it by this way if you have Dante DiVincenzo on your team and you've got him in your team currently and you're in New York Nick and you need some threes and some points to win this week but your points are looking dicey and your steals are really secure you'd burn Dante DiVincenzo you drop him off your waiver wire and you pick up RJ Barrett because he scores almost double the amount of points of Dante DiVincenzo he scores 0 0.4 as of last year, threes less. You get those points in. You are giving up a steal a game. But again, if you're, you're buffered and built in, but he's giving you more rebounds and he's giving you like 0.7 of an assist less. So you're still going to get what you need to possibly win that week in a tight one, especially come fantasy playoffs time. And guys like Isaiah Hartenstein, if Mitch Robinson goes down, he becomes a target, especially for field goal percentage. If you're punting free throw percentage with that caveat, he gets you rebounds. And the big thing about this, his blocks per game, he used to be much better as a shot blocker. Last year, he was really down to 0.8 blocks a game. So if that can return some value and he can see a return as a starter, because he does block more shots as a starter with those starter minutes, he's a guy that you can stream in. So the only draftable guys, Breno, you would say uh, Jalen Brunson, Julius Randall, um, Josh Hart, Mitch Robinson are the 100% guys you can draft with confidence in your fantasy drafts. You might be looking to waive the other guys or trade them over the course of the year, to be honest. Yeah. Would I be yeah. wrong in that? Or No, nah, I reckon you're spot on, mate. I don't I don't see uh, – and we're talking 12-team, 9-cat, obviously. Team, so, you know, 144 players in, in most of these drafts, so – 
yeah, do I see any top 144 value? I mean, I might take a flyer in the last round on a, on a guy like Quickly um, or even Dante. But, I mean, look, there, there's so many more upside, high upside players, I think, around the back end of the draft I'd probably prefer than, uh, than these guys. But at least we know that there's minutes there. I mean, even Emmanuel yep. Quickly, who feel like he didn't play at all last year, he averaged 20, well, 20, what was it, 28.9 minutes a game in the, in the games that he played. Because we know that Thibodeau, anybody who is the 10th man on the roster or, or you know, to the 15th man on the roster, it's it's like sitting on the end of the bench at New York Knicks is like some sort of abyss uh, that never sees the court. So he relies very heavily on his nine guys, his nine-man rotation that are all going to play 25 to 35 minutes a game. We see that Brunson and Randall both average 35 minutes a game, which is relatively high in the grand scheme of things all season so you know the minutes are there for these guys and Quentin Grimes I, I would argue might be a late round flyer that you might want to take a punt on and see because at the end of the day if you take him in the last round it doesn't work you just drop him and you pick up someone off the waivers that has had a really nice start to the season yeah you handball him and you, you look, look to be fair I'm probably being too like too like aggressive with how much I'm saying not to draft manual quickly look if he's there in the 130s and you need some extra points and you some threes he's a, he's a great addition by way of points and threes and, and for three free throw percentage like i've actually streamed him in before when he's been dropped but he is a guy that you can find of like putting his thumb out on the side of the highway saying pick me up that's Emmanuel quickly's life in fantasy basketball at this point because people will drop a guy around that ranking to get someone who's really moving like quickly or who's just blown up <laughs> moving quickly um they'll they'll pick up a guy like that really like swiftly one would say mm. uh, yes. and, and and drop a guy like quickly. And that's where you can get him in streaming for a couple of weeks while he's hot um, or what they're doing. These guys, I don't think they're any dissimilar to last year and they had a few injuries. Uh, they had a really good season by way of 47 wins. If the under right now, the over under is 44 and a half. I'm going overs. I'm going possibly 48 wins for them this season. I think 44 and a half is low. I think if, if you're a punting man, if you're a betting man and you, you, you don't mind throwing a cheeky little fiver or something on a, on a bet, I'd take the overs on this. I, I think that they're better than a 44 win team. Yeah. Uh, I think they'll probably, I'm with you on that. I think maybe closer to 50 than 45 personally. Um, yeah. Do I see them competing this year? Uh, I don't see them beating teams like Miami, Boston, Milwaukee, you know, they're, they're not at that level, but they will finish mid table. I think in the East as they did last year, I don't see too much regression, but also not really much progression either. No, I think a couple of wins, like there were some close wins last year, Like but these are, they, they got better at the trade deadline last year and they've done mm. nothing since then to tell me that they've got worse. So this is definitely a team that I think can be like a 47, 48 plus win team. And I'm smashing the over. This will be part of my 10 teams that I put out to be like, these are my unders and overs of my best 10 picks. If it stays at 44 and a half, oh, I'm going over. Let me ask you this. Yep. If Julius Randle goes down this year, if he gets injured, which mm -hmm. good chance he will, they're yep. incredibly thin at the power forward spot. I mean, who have you got? Go. Who have you Idiot. got to come in? Isaiah Roby. They've got Isaiah Roby to come in and play the four, which don't get me wrong. Isaiah Roby, OKC days is great. His OKC resume is fantastic, but... I mean, when he played or when he had any chance of actually getting minutes, with he got some minutes. That's right. That's, and I mean, he occasion. didn't really do too much at the Spurs either, but the talent is there. I actually don't mind him as a player. I think he's okay. Um, but it just shows how thin they are in the backup yeah. power forward spot. And, you know, we saw last year when Hartenstein actually got minutes that he actually ended up when, when Randall was out and Mitch Robinson was out, he averaged 7.1 assists per game. Yep. Like this, this guy is a guy, a good facilitator at the five. So, they're, like I mentioned earlier, those guys are guys you pick up uh, as soon as there's an injury to Mitch Robinson, to Julius Randle. Uh, one, if Randle goes down, the Knicks are in all sorts of dramas and you probably want to cash out on that over 44 and a half bet. But um, really if they stay healthy, if he stays healthy, uh, they, they're they probably looking at closer to 50 wins this year. Yeah, look, I'm if they, if, if he goes yeah. down, this is again the whole thing, like who do you trade, who do you keep into your team? If They, they, they probably need to bring some support back in, by way of and virtue of a, of a really good and decent power forward. Um, I think they'll run small ball quite a lot, like Warriors-esque small ball with the Kevon Looney thing. And I know that's not like, but when they, when they Warriors roll out that lineup and Kevin is the only big guy on the floor, I can see that being the case. Or they could go super athletic and nimble uh, and they could run like Jalen Brunson, Josh Hart, Dante DiVincenzo, because they're going to need some form of defense out there with like an Emmanuel Quickly or a Quentin Grimes. 
And then they'll probably run out like, this is where Jericho Sims season, like young athletic guys could possibly come in and, and do a bit more work, I would see. But yeah, they're definitely weak in that spot. So their depth chart outside that isn't uh, very strong. But how they're built and the way that they're built for the last two or three seasons, they've been consistent, you know, and they've brought back. This is the thing I do like about this Knicks team. They've brought some passion back to New York Knicks basketball in the city of New York. Like, I love it when they get a win and you see the streets and flooded, like with people, like, you know, there's Spike going, yeah, you know, wearing his Jordans on the side, like pumping them up and being a dick to, you know, Trey Young or whoever it is on the sideline, talking in their face. Like, that is basketball. Like, that's why we fell in love with this game. So I kind of dig this Knicks team for what they've done for the game of New York, like the game of basketball in New York City. And I'm having the overs, Brano. I like it. I, I hope they do well. It's one of the teams yeah. that I, I don't dislike them. I hope they do well. Um, we want good things for you. We do. We do. All the New York Knicks fans out there, we're on your team. Trust me. Um, mate, before we wrap up the show, uh, quick shout out to our two sponsors. The Standard Squeeze one, they've, they've been with us for the last seven, eight months. They've got an awesome promo code for us, Insight15. You can see on the screen if you're watching us on YouTube, our uh, – Mr. G Wiz is showing off his four in one, which keeps your coffees nice and hot. And what do you got in it, the Savo, mate? Not rose. Not rose. It's it's rose, everybody. Uh, but it keeps it nice and cold, mate. So uh, and obviously we've got the you know the awesome uh, bottles and, and packs that they have, where it pours the perfect thirty mil shot, saves you taking glass away, saves you breaking glass, all that kind of stuff. So use your the code Insight fifteen at the standard squeeze.com. They'll look after you there. And of course, Ryan from Astute News said we can't talk about a show or talk about NBA without talking about our mate Ryan. So he's your man for all finance for home loans, business loans, personal loans. He's got you covered. So if you're in Australia, you can get an oblig no obligation free consult. All you need to do is mention the Insight team sent you and he'll look after you and you can contact him at Ryan Astute Newstead on Instagram or email at Ryan H at EganWealth.com. Mate, before we wrap this one up, I want to throw to oh. you because we've got a pretty cool giveaway that we're doing when we reach a thousand subs. And what are we, 780 at the moment? So we're actually getting pretty yeah, close. What are we what are we doing once we reach a thousand, mate? We need you to put your I'm gonna I'm I, I said I'm gonna pay for this personally. And all of the boys, the founding five, we call this the starting five here at Insight. We're like, no, we're all gonna chip in, we're gonna make this happen. I, I I live in Sydney, you live in Sydney here. We see throwback store down the way in NBA jerseys go with those guys. We see them in the streets, and I was like, how cool would it be just for anyone around the world to be able to wear a jersey that we sent them. So the giveaway is this. When we get to 1,000 subscribers on our YouTube channel, if you leave your name in the comments, don't have to leave your team or the size, just quote your name and also maybe give us like a subscription bing, on the bell. Get onto iTunes, Spotify, do all the things as well because that would be very nice of you because we're doing a nice thing. But all you need to do is leave a comment under this section in the YouTube video, write your name. We're going to take all those names. We're going to put a lucky wheel up in one of our pods and we're going to send you a very personalized jersey of your favorite NBA team from NBA.com. We're going to log on there. We're going to pay for it out of the own box. This is not a sponsored thing at all. We just want to do this so one punter can wear their team with pride thanks to Inside Sports. So get us to 1,000 and get a jersey on your back. Done. Love that. Love that. We're, we're very excited. If we can get there before the NBA season starts, we'll be in a bloody good spot and uh, somebody will be wearing their jersey to the very first game of the year. So, uh, mate, Nick's done and dusted. Thanks for joining me. It's been a pleasure, as always. Uh, we'll be Thank back. You. I'm sure you've got plenty more awesome uh, shows planned in the near future as well. Yeah, we've got some big ones coming up. We've got a um, Slippers. Uh, we're going to call them the slippers. If you know anything about horse racing and the golden slipper, we're going to call these guys the slippers, the dudes who are kind of slipping back in drafts with Matty O'Brien coming up. We've got some sleepers to watch. We've got the slippers. We've got the do not touch list. We've also got the do not do this mock draft number two, where we're going to actually try and draft using common mistakes to show you what value you can miss out on. And that's going to be a, in advance drafting of ADP. Don't do it. It sucks. So we've got that in the pipe as well. We've got some very special guests, including Alex Reclean, uh, Adam King on the way, and a whole bunch more. And yourself, Bruno. We'll catch you really soon for another mock, my brother. Absolutely, guys. If you made it to the end, hit subscribe, hit like. We'll see you for the next episode. Catch you later. Cheers.